Welcome to this second installment of the Ultimate Minecraft Redstone Guide. In this video, we're going to be going over the advanced power components. In the previous one, we went over simple power components. And if you want to check out any more of those, all of those links will be in the description. I have a playlist on my channel with all of the videos in one place. I'd recommend checking that out for context if anything in this video confuses you. Today, we'll start straight off with talking about the target block. The target block is a power component that outputs a signal strength when hit by a projectile, such as an arrow. The more accurate the shot, the stronger the signal, so the bullseye being signal strength of 15. Another thing to note about the target block is that it actually redirects the redstone to point towards it when the redstone is adjacent to it. This is super useful if you need to compact any of your redstone machines. Um, for example, we have a target block line here with a redstone line next to it and some torches on top. And if you power the redstone line, all of the torches turn off because the redstone is pointing towards those opaque blocks. And by the way, when I say opaque, I'm not only referring to the fact that you can't see through it, I'm also referring to its redstone property. Opaque blocks like stone and wood can carry redstone signals through them. They can be strongly powered, whereas transparent blocks such as glass cannot. In redstone terminology, opaque blocks are often referred to as solid blocks. Those two terms are interchangeable in redstone commonly. Um, so it's good to know what those terms mean. All right, moving on to the trap chest. The trap chest works just like a regular chest, except with one key difference. The trap chest emits a redstone signal based on the number of players looking into it. For example, in this case, it's just me. I'm looking into it. You can see the redstone power of one. If there was two people on looking into it, it'd be two, three, etc. Um, it also strongly powers the block beneath it, which can have interesting effects. For example, if you wanted to do a TNT trap, you could put a block of TNT in the ground, a block on top of that, and then a trap chest. And whenever someone were to look in the trap chest, it would strongly power the block, igniting the TNT. So that's kind of a fun trap. Okay, let's move on to the tripwire hook. On its own, the tripwire hook doesn't do anything. So to set it up, you need to place two hooks directly across from each other and connect them with string. And they're kind of like pressure plates where they detect players and entities that cross them, that walk over them. And because the string is nearly invisible, these are great for nearly indetectable traps. Just a few interesting facts about tripwire hooks. The maximum length they can be is 40 blocks, and if you break the string with anything but shears, then it will temporarily power the blocks it's attached to, simulating a, if someone were to walk through it. So basically, you can't disarm the trap without setting it off without shears. All right, moving right along to the daylight sensor. The daylight sensor is a super unique component because it measures the amount of the brightness of daylight that its block is in. Essentially, the brighter the time of day, the stronger the signal strength will be. The dimmer the time of day, so nighttime, the weaker it'll be. One thing to note about this is it can be reversed, so you can right-click it and it will reverse itself, detecting shade instead. And because it measures daylight, placing opaque blocks above the sensor will change its effectiveness in measuring daylight because it's now detecting a little bit of shade. So for the best effect, ensure that the daylight sensor has an unobstructed column straight to the sky. Here's just a quick time lapse of two daylight sensors, one in day mode, one in night mode, working from morning to morning in a Minecraft day, and the corresponding graph showing the signal strength for each time of day. Pretty niche information, but if you ever need it, it's good to know. These are super useful if you want an automatic system that turns on lights at night. So just for a little bit more of immersiveness in your world, you can use daylight sensors. Okay, next up is the lightning rod. This one's pretty simple. When it's struck by lightning, it emits a redstone pulse. <laughs> it strongly powers the block it's attached to for exactly eight tenths of a second, and that's it. All right, next item on the list is the lectern. So the lectern isn't traditionally considered a redstone component, but it does have two redstone capabilities. First of which is when you have a book on the lectern, a comparator 
placed adjacent to the lectern can actually read the page that the book is on. The signal strength will be proportional to the page of the book. So like the last page will be, always be 15 and the first page will always be zero. So if you have 15 pages in your book, you can have one page per signal strength. This can be used for any machine that requires a variable input. For example, if you wanted to make a potion brewery that makes multiple potions, you could use a lectern to select the potion that you want. So like put a potion on each page and then the comparator can read that signal strength and send that signal to the machine accordingly. All right, so the second use of the lectern is when you turn the page, it actually emits a very, very short redstone pulse for each page turn. In fact, this is the shortest redstone pulse you can get from any single component. And it lasts just what's known as one game tick. Essentially, game ticks are Minecraft's way of measuring time in the game. So without any lag, ideally, there are 20 game ticks per second. However, redstone generally isn't measured in game ticks. We usually use redstone ticks, which are twice as long, clocking at 10 per second. Um, so if you're, if you're interested in learning more about ticks, feel free to visit the Minecraft wiki for more information. It's just a little too dense for this video, but that's just a brief synopsis. Okay, speaking of ticks, this brings us to the observer. The observer can detect any block changes on its face side, and it sends out a one redstone tick pulse from the back side with a signal strength of 15. For example, if I place a block on its face side, you can see it powers the redstone dust at the back. Similarly, if I break the block, the observer detects that change and sends out another pulse. Observers are super commonly used in automatic machines such as farms. For instance, when the sugar crane grows to the third block, this observer can detect the growth and triggers the pistons to chop it down automatically. All right, next in line is the jukebox. When a disc is inserted to the jukebox, it emits a signal strength of 15 to adjacent redstone components. Also, each disc has a different comparator value, and I'll show those values here on the screen. So if for whatever reason you want to tell automatically what disc you're playing, you can do that with the comparator. All right, so we saved the most complicated power components for last the skulk sensor and the calibrated skulk sensor. So the first thing to know about the skulk sensors is that they detect sounds and vibrations in a radius around them and output a redstone signal accordingly. So there's two things that affect the output of the skulk sensors. One is the loudness of a sound and the other is the distance of the sound. So the louder the sound is, the stronger the strength will be and the closer the sound is, the stronger the strength will be on the output. So these two variables together determine the skulk sensor's redstone signal strength on the output. So we have two variations here, the normal skulk sensor and the calibrated skulk sensor. The normal skulk sensors detect vibrations within an eight block radius and emit redstone signals proportional to those two variables, the strength and proximity. Whereas the calibrated skulk sensor operates a little bit differently, it has a detection range of 16 blocks, so twice as wide as the normal sensors, and it its signal duration is a little bit shorter, dropping from 30 redstone ticks with the normal one to about 10 redstone ticks with the calibrated one. And the final standout feature of the calibrated skulk sensors is their ability to filter vibrations. So when you power a redstone signal into the crystallized side of the calibrated skulk sensor, they only respond to vibrations that match the strength of that signal. So for example, eating food emits a signal strength vibration of eight. So if you want your skulk sensor to only activate when you eat food, then you would input a redstone signal strength of eight into the crystallized side then the sensor will exclusively respond to vibrations with a frequency of eight. There are a couple ways to avoid detection though. Sneaking near a skulk sensor can prevent your steps from being heard and also using wool to block vibrations from reaching it. So if you don't want your sensor to detect sounds from one side, simply place wool on that side. 
and if you don't want your skulk sensor to detect you at all just surround it with wool and that'll do the trick all right that should do it for the advanced power component section of this series next video will be about transmission components so if you have any questions about those be sure to check that video out thanks for tuning in and i'll catch you in the next one see ya